Hi, my name is Laura Kalbach and today I'll be introducing state charts and state machines. If you've come to this session thinking, help, I don't know what these are, that is what I am here for. Because really, I was in your exact position just a couple of months ago, a real state machines and state charts baby. And what follows is what I've learned over the last couple of months, explained in a way that I can understand. As a person who has no background in computer science and absolutely hates any kind of unnecessary complexity. Designers and collaborators can rejoice because state charts are a visual language. So appealing, isn't it? They're used to describe the states in a process. You may have used similar diagrams in the past to design user flows, maybe plan databases or map your app architecture. State charts are another way of using these boxes and arrows to represent flows. But with XState, these flows are also executable code that can be used to control the logic of your applications. If you were going to draw a state chart for the process of a dog, yes, a dog, there are two states that would first come to mind, asleep and awake. A dog is always asleep or awake. The dog can't be asleep and awake at the same time. And it's impossible for the dog to be neither asleep nor awake. There's only these two states, a precisely limited finite number of states. And I'll come back to that finite bit in a minute. The states in state charts are represented by these rounded rectangle boxes. And how the dog goes between asleep and awake is through transitions which is symbolized by an arrow pointing from one state to the next state in the process. Transition is caused by an event that results in the changes of the state. And these transitions are labeled with their events. Transitions and events are deterministic. Deterministic means that each transition and event always points to the same next state and always produces the same result from that given starting condition every time the process is run. Another way of putting it is that dogs never wake up to fall asleep or fall asleep to wake up. It is always going through those states in that same predictable order. This tiny little dog process with its two finite states, as I mentioned earlier, and two transitions is a finite state machine. A state machine is used to describe the behavior of something, anything. The machine describes the thing's states and the transitions between those states. It's a finite state machine because it has a finite number of states. Sometimes you'll find finite state machines abbreviated to FSM. That's just people who love jargon. We can safely ignore them. Any process that has states will have an initial state, the default state that the process exists in until an event happens to change that process's state. Using a state chart to describe the process of walking the dog, the initial state would be waiting to walk. And the initial state is represented by that little filled circle with an arrow pointing from the circle to the initial state. Most processes with states will have a final state, the last state when the process is finished. In the dog walking state chart, the final state would be walk complete. And the final state is represented by a double border on the state's rounded rectangle box. And so between the waiting and the walk complete states, we'd have the on a walk state. And you transition between waiting and going for a walk with the leave home event and transition between the going for a walk and walk complete with the arrive home event. Compound states are where state charts really start to shine compared to the other charts we might be used to. And they're one of the features that makes state charts capable of handling way more complexity than an everyday state machine. So a compound state is a state that can contain more states, also known as child states. And these child states can only happen when the parent compound state is happening. So let's have a look at what an on a walk 
compound state might contain. First off, compound state symbolized by a rounded rectangle box, like any other state, that acts as a container for its child states and is always labeled with its own state as well, so you know what state it is. In the on a walk state, there could be the child states of walking, running, and stopping to sniff good smells, all the good stuff you do on a dog walk, which would each have their own transition events. And I know that this started to look quite busy at this point, but actually if you look at it carefully, everything is quite simple. It has its states, each state has its transitions to the other states. All of these states exist inside the on a walk state and as part of the overall dog walk state chart. A compound state should also specify which child state is the initial state. In the on a walk compound state, the initial state is walking. An atomic state is a state that doesn't have any child states. So waiting, walking, uh, walk complete, walking, running, stopping to sniff good smells, all of those are atomic states. The on or walk state is the one that's not an atomic state because it has child states. Can't be an atomic state if it has child states. Parallel states allow us to get like to even more complex processes. So a parallel state is a compound state where all of its child states, also known as regions, are active simultaneously at the same time. The regions are separated inside that compound state container by a dashed line. And inside the on a walk compound state, there could be two regions. We'll just do two for now. A dog, you could have loads and loads of regions in this, but I think for this case, for the size of the slide and the screen, I think it's important that we just have two. <laughs> You'll see why. One region contains the dog's activity child states of walking, running, stopping to sniff good smells. That's the state that we looked at before. And the other region contains the dog's tail states of not wagging and wagging. So the dog can walk and wag its tail, run and wag its tail, or stop and sniff while wagging its tail. It can also do any of these activities without wagging its tail. The states in each region happen simultaneously. Both regions should also specify which child state is the initial state. I keep going on about these initial states, but it's the thing that I forget the most. In our tail region, the initial state is not wagging. A self-transition was when an event happens, but the transition returns to the same state. So the transition arrow exits and re-enters that same state. So if we're going back to dogs again, because dogs are great, in a dog begging process, there will be a begging state with a gets treat event. And for the dogs who kind of love their food, no matter how many times you go through that gets treat event, you know that the dog is going to return to its begging state. And the initial state, of course, begging. One of the benefits of state charts is that in the process of putting a state chart together, you explore all of the possible states in your process. And this exploration will help you avoid bugs and errors in your code, as you're more likely to cover all of the eventualities. And because your state charts are executable, they can behave as both the diagram and as the code. So cool. Making it less likely that you'll introduce differences and bugs when you're trying to interpret between the diagramming and the coding environments. No more throwing things over the wall. There is no wall. So let's have a quick look at how you might go about planning a state chart. And you'll get some really good insight into this in Fazard's talk later as well. To draw a state chart for a login machine, start by listing the basic events in the process. So generally, these will be the things that your login machine will do. So just to start, really simple, log in and log out. And then list the states that exist as a result of those events. So we've got logged in and logged out. And once there's some events and states, 
there's the beginnings of your state chart. See, got my little initial state going on there as well. Don't forget it. <laughs> and in this case, the logged out state is the initial state because any new user would come to the login process logged out. You don't magically like arrive at things already logged in when you've never even heard of them before. Some login and logout processes will log out an inactive user after like a fixed length of time, like a kind of security measure. We could use delayed transitions for this. So before I get directly into the delayed transition, first we'll make our logged in state into a compound state. And because we'll only keep track of like whether a user is active when they're actually logged in, we can't do that when they're logged out. The child states of our logged in compound state are active and idle. The user is either active or idle. The initial state of the logged in compound state is active because it's safe to assume that if a user is just logged in, they're active. And the event on the transition between idle and active is when there's activity. That is, we know a user is no longer idle if there's some activity. And we can use the delayed transition, what I mentioned before, between active and idle, because we'll determine the inactivity as a lack of activity for one minute. The delayed transition is labeled with after and a fixed duration. And that indicates how much time should pass before transitioning to the next indicated state. That's what makes it a delayed transition. We'll also use a delayed transition of three minutes following the idle state to transition to an auto logged out state. If the user remains idle, that's when we'll log them out. And that will be the final state. A state chart is used to set off actions in the system outside of the state chart. Actions are also commonly known as effects or side effects. And side effects sounds like weirdly negative or unimportant, but it's actually the whole point of state charts. The whole point of state charts is setting off actions. You actually want to use these state charts to do something in your code. An action on a state is included inside the state's container with an entry and a slash or an exit and a slash label, depending on whether the action should be fired on entry or on exit from the state. So in the login state chart, there's an entry action on the idle state to warn the user they may be logged out. So that's the position when we'll fire off an action to warn that user, yeah, you might be logged out if you stay inactive. We're all used to seeing those dialogues, right? So why would you use state charts for state management? Well, for one, state charts make it easy to understand just the small pieces of logic as equally well as you understand that greater whole logic of your application. State charts can do complexity really well. So that works really well with the like small to big. They scale really easily from your tiny little machines, which you'll see I make a lot of tiny little machines, <laughs> to machines inside machines that match like the complexity of your application. You're doing state management anyway. So why not formalize it in a way that gives you an overview and a detailed view and can handle that complexity? Because whatever you're building, your handling state, whether you're handling it well is a different matter. And state charts are understandable by the whole team. This is one of the reasons why state charts really appeal to me in the first place. Like I'm a designer and a developer, and I fundamentally believe that we build better applications when every discipline is included from the start of a project. That way we gain the benefit of everyone's expertise. And if your project manager and your designer and your developer can all collaborate on your code without requiring any translation between them, I mean, isn't that the dream? So you can find all of the examples from this talk as actual machines in X state on the stately registry. If you go to the registry, if you follow that link, you'll be able to find me, but you type my name in, Laura, probably the only Laura on there at the moment, probably, hopefully. Um, if you are a Laura and you want to join, please do. <laughs> and so you can search and you can just find my little examples up in there. Thank you.
And if you like my talk, just you wait until you hear Matt and Fazard's talks. They're going to get into the really good stuff. All right, so let's move on to the discussion. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. I think uh, I learned a lot. I hope other people picked up a lot of uh, concepts and ideas as well. Uh, let's check out some comments. I guess that's <laughs> kind of obvious. It's good that Schrodinger having a dog. And uh, I mean, we were discussing that why, why do you use dogs as an example instead of cats? But cats are not deterministic. That was the point. <laughs> yeah, so that far too unpredictable. <laughs> Nothing yeah, finite exactly. about cats. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, again, we have this Finnish audience that's not so excited about asking questions. Uh, so, does anyone have something in mind to ask? Or I can, I've got a couple of questions that I could yeah. ask uh, Matt Fazard related to my talk. In, when you two wanted to learn about state machines and state charts how did you learn about them oh that's a good question um i think i i what i well what i wish i had was this talk actually um to explain things in a kind of visual formalism actually and explain how these things visually sort of match up to each other i mostly did it just by making a ton of mistakes usually the way um a lot of people learn most things I really, really liked what you did about um, laying out the events that your app that can happen in your app first, or the, in the behavior that you're trying to model, and then laying out the states afterwards. Um, I think that's a really great way of doing it, and how I felt sort of naturally um, w made the most sense to me. But I'm pretty sure that I I learned that from watching a video that you did, because <laughs> that's the great thing that working with these really clever people at Stately is that I've been able to. Uh, learn from the people who understand it the best and be able to pick up the elements that I can get from you. But also, because sometimes I feel like I'm just a bit of a designer head, like I'm really visually focused. It's one of the ap appeals of state charts to me and one of the reasons why I think that they could be so useful as a collaborative tool because the designer part of me and the developer part of me really gets how it works. Uh, but the designer part of me is what really just loves having that visual representation because ev like nearly everyone gets the idea of boxes and arrows we understand how these flows work and so it's so easy to bring anybody in with them absolutely so i have a question so what, what would you su success for someone that who has never done any state machine stuff how to get started how to get started with the state machines that's, the, that's oh. the question that's a really good question. I would say go to the um, stately visualizer and have a go at modeling a state chart for something as simple as a dog or um, a, the process that you use to make your coffee in the morning uh, or something like that, that to just help you get your head around it. And when you have any questions, because you might do like our documentation, which I am trying to improve for X state um, isn't quite there yet. I want to make it easier for people who are as beginnery as me. Uh, but if you go to the Discord that um, we've got for X state, I think it's actually called the stately Discord, then um, you can ask any kind of question in there. And there's the most helpful and wonderful community who will help you with any kind of question you have. No question is stupid. Everyone is treated kindly there. <laughs> 